thank you for coming. Um, I, of course, want to start uh, thanking the uh, Radcliffe Institute, uh, Institute and all the wonderful people that have, uh, who have been uh, helping us during all these months. This is a, a great experience that I will never forget. And I also, at the same time, would like to express my concern and sadness for uh, all the uh, difficult situations that my country, Peru, is currently uh, ongoing. So it's very sad to see how uh, we uh, are losing brothers and sisters who are just uh, trying to uh, make uh, the country a little bit more fair. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to give a talk uh, in a positive um, way under these circumstances, but you know life is like this, and we always get this kind of accident. So I will be talking about uh, actually things that I believe that are um, uh, that uh, are letting us look at the future of, of languages from a more positive uh, way, at least I, I, I hope. And so let me well. Claudia already said a few things about me, but as Claudia said, I am a Peruvian linguist, and I work on the description and documentation and also revitalization of indigenous languages spoken in the Peruvian Amazon. I am the father of Eugenia and Francisco, and just by, you know, I'm, I was really lucky to uh, become Mariana's husband. Uh, and as Claudia already said, my hobby is to cook. I like to cook, and I never use recipes. That's the thing. I always try to imagine how things are done. Okay, uh, also, um, uh, now let me tell you a little bit about Peru and their languages. Officially, there are 48 languages in Peru. Uh, at least this is, this is what the government says. I believe that the number is indeed higher, uh, but you know, it's always difficult to count languages and distinguish uh, two languages from two dialects of the same language, so it's a tricky thing. So when you ask a linguist, how many languages are in Peru? Uh, real linguists will say, I don't know. And of course, you, you seem to be a bad linguist, but this is what you are supposed to say, because actually we don't know for sure. If we take 48 as uh, a number, uh, as a, you know, some kind of reference number, uh, I can say that eight of the, of the 48 languages listed in those uh, uh, lists have less than 10 speakers. So approximately 20% 20, 20 of, of the linguistic diversity of my country is in risk. And if we go beyond in the past, at least 40 Peruvian languages disappeared, at least 40 Peruvian languages disappeared since the arrival of the uh, Europeans. Uh, in this uh, uh, context, I was, you know, counting actually the number of, of languages I have worked with for this talk for the first time in my life, and I discovered that I have conducted uh, linguistic or, you know, social work on 22 Peruvian languages. So that means that I'm getting old. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the, you always take out the, the linguistic results of that work. Uh, you try to publish it and become, you know, a professor and a linguist and so on. But uh, at the same time, you meet wonderful people who uh, change uh, your uh, life and the ways in which you uh, see things around you in a very deep way. Uh, so I'm, I feel blessed to say that uh, some of these people um, are like my family. And you know, if my mother is look, uh, watching this on Zoom, she will know for sure that she has uh, some competitors around. <laughs> um, they, they actually uh, taught me how to become a linguist. And I think that I'm still learning. You know, I, 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 I honestly believe that I have a lot uh, amount of, of, of knowledge to, to uh, try to acquire the following year. So I have a lot of things to do. But one of the things that I learned from these uh, friends and family is that uh, actually uh, you can't do linguistic work if you don't care about uh, the conservation and revitalization of the languages you work uh, with. And this is something that I learned from, from, from these wonderful people. In this talk, I would like to uh, um, uh, talk or introduce to you to one of these uh, 
um, friends or you know these people who I have met in these years. And her name is uh, Nahuanica in Isconagua or Nelita Rodriguez in Spanish. She is an Isconagua speaker. And as, as, as you already know, there are only four native speakers of this language. Um, I conducted a documentation project between 2013 and 2016 with the Isconagua people. And after that, I uh, developed a friendship and love, I hope mutual, <laughs> with uh, Nelita. We are like, we are constantly in touch and I really want to uh, say thanks publicly in this space to, to her. Um, we have been working together in different publications. I have, on, I, I have visited her house for long periods with my family, my daughter. Well, actually, if you look at here, Francisco is there. So also with Francisco and of course with my wife, Mariana. But instead of saying words about Nelita, let me, uh, you know, let, let me introduce you to her in a, in a real way. So there is, some, uh, there is a video where you can actually uh, listen to her saying th very deep things. No con Anu de que no con Anu de que Nelita Rodríguez Campos la ua de que callería de callería en co callería en co de que ua comunidad nativa de callería ahí de que ua no a nawa nawa no raga ni que te nawa no raga ni que te me dijo ni hermo no raga ni que te daba ならばくおわいきなとなとひっぴのとパロおわかよらのうわおわいきばくばくおくあびうしなねうんうんほたぼいっぱおにうんはのぼいっぱおにうしなねうんはのぼとあっぱおにぼしなねあとうんはのうん
as part of the Peruvian society in legal terms, because they were there, but as an, an uncontacted group, uh, 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 people living in voluntary isolation. These are the pictures of the uh, five last speakers, native speakers that I met, and unfortunately, she, Kiste, um, um, passed away a few uh, months ago. Uh, and you know the fascinating uh, thing is that some of the so the people I work with are the, the same people who are in that picture. They they were contacted. They they have these memories of living before the contact, and they always say we used to live naked. So they kind of like that. So and of course they will say that uh, they used to live naked, and that they will never get sick. So this is how they remember the previous time to the contact with the missionaries, and the rest of the Peruvian country. So, uh, to, uh, now I will try to explain how this experience, experience has changed my way of looking at language and linguistics. So basically, uh, there is something that I call the community bios, which has to do with the idea that many linguists assume that languages are spoken by communities, by speech communities or communities of speakers. And um, unfortunately, Iskonawa is currently neither socially used nor transmitted. The other idea that is, uh, has been very difficult to deal with from my own training while working with Iskonawa people is what, something that I call the regularity bias. The idea that languages, that grammar is regular. Of course, irregularity exists, but it's always, always a marginal, a marginal phenomenon. And as you will see today, Iskonawa exhibits an unusual radical degree of variability that challenges this idea. And you know, we were trained to deal and describe regularities. And when you approach something that is different, you feel like, okay, I spent you know, so, I, you know, so many years and I study, I, was, I tried to be a good student, you know, and in vain, because all what I learned doesn't work or doesn't, is not useful for dealing with a language with this uh, characteristic. And the last values that I found in myself, those are biases that I found in, in my own uh, way of thinking, is something that I call something like the pure science bios. The idea that, you know, I am a linguist, so I, I, I want to publish and I get to provide, I want to provide uh, insights about the, the, the structure of language or how people, you know, how we humans learn to speak or develop languages in our history and so on and so on. But of course, you can't just look at these kind of uh, issues and, or, and questions when you work uh, in a situation like the Iskonawa situation. When you, when you work there, you just feel that you know, everything is wrong. You, you should first care about revitalization. You should do education. You should get involved in, in what actually the community is uh, requesting. And, uh, and actually, um, this is uh, something that has been happening in the last years in my work with the Iskonawa. So you have theory, methodology, and action. These are th three fundamental aspects of linguistic, uh, of, the, of language sciences that have, that have been changed in my mind and my heart due to my work with the Iskonawa people. But before some uh, thoughts on terminology, uh, I would say that uh, perhaps this idea that languages die is it's a very, I don't know how to pronounce that word in English. I used to, but I forgot, macabre, mac macabre? Uh, well, horrible, horrible, scary metaphors that we use in, in, in language sciences. And this is why some uh, language activists from California, particularly uh, L. Frank Mar Manriquez, said we should stop talking about dead languages. What we have there are sleeping languages that can be awakened under some certain conditions. And this is something that uh, is now the norm. We all talk about dormant languages or sleeping languages. But when you move to languages with very, very small number of speakers, we still call them obsolescing, which means something that is not useful anymore or uh, nearly extinct, which is something that is getting into extinction, or moribund, which is something that is about to die. So 
um, I have been struggling myself trying to find a, a better term, and I think that we should acknowledge that the fact that we have languages like Iskonawa uh, and speakers of those languages still trying to, you know, to get involved in language revitalization, it's a wonderful and unique example of cultural resistance. And this is why, instead of talking about obsolescing or moribund languages, I, is, I have been talking about surviving languages, languages that are still there. And in, instead of looking at the fact that they are maybe reaching, you know, these um, situations where we won't have any speakers, we have to look at, at, at the fact that their existence right now with us is a miracle. And this is why I, I, I prefer to use this more positive um, way to refer to them. So now, theory. Since the beginning of general, you know, modern general linguistics, we got this idea that the community of speakers is something that is relevant to define language. So language structure, community of speakers, and time. These are three fundamental aspects of any definition of language since Ferdinand de Saussure, who is some sort of father of modern linguistics. And the idea uh, behind this is that we have a community, and community makes agreement, ag agreements on, on, on things. Unconscious, maybe, not overtly uh, expressed, but still, we all agree that this is a computer, this is a chair, and if you want to be a speaker of English, you have to call this a chair. So the idea is that language is a social phenomenon, like this. <laughs> so we have people doing the same, and this is apparently something that is very important for language. We try to, well, at the same time we are creative and of course languages change, but we really try to speak alike our community fellows. Like in Radcliffe, we probably try to, no, we, we don't, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. So, and this in some way reinforces regularity. So, the, the, the idea uh, behind this is that languages are so regular and so similar because social, there is some sort of social pressure on them. But of course, when you listen to me, if, if you understand me, if you understand my English, you will probably um, notice that languages in homogeneous communities I by, are by far more uniform than the needs of communication would demand. Okay, and this is a very old idea from a wonderful, wonderful American linguist that I am reading, well, in deep for the first time in my life. And actually, I admire him, He's, uh, Leonard Bloomfield, and he has this idea, and it's true. We don't need to speak that alike to understand each other. So the, the motivation for that uh, homogeneity is not just communication. There is something else re related to, to community. And then we have all this, so I, am as, I myself define myself as a functional linguist. And that means basically that I assume that language should be explained and described in terms of how it is used. This is what it means to be a functional linguist. And it's everywhere, uh, conditions imposed by their usage, um, reference to communication. So this idea, this uh, idea of functional linguists is that actually you should explain and describe language based on the fact that languages are used. Okay, so here there is a very interesting theoretical question. What would happen to the theoretical definition of language from a functional point of view if we take community of speakers out of the picture. You know? Like in the case of Isconawa, this language is not used in a daily basis. So this is a very fundamental question. And you know, functional linguists should be very interesting of getting um, and testing their hypothesis in communities like this. You know? Okay, you see? So what will happen? 
how can we describe these communicative and social pressures that are supposed to shape language structure, you know, that, that give the form to language that actually language has? And this is what I am actually trying to do here. So uh, surviving languages are not used by, uh, this is a, a big, uh, something that my wife made for me. I didn't want to put it, but she forced me, so it's her fault. Um, and it's the same shirt, so it's a kind of funny thing. So, so surviving languages are not used by prototypical speech communities. So by studying the dynamics of the world's surviving languages, we can test functional accounts of na the nature of language. If social use shapes grammar to whichever extent, because there are different uh, positions in rel relation to this uh, statement, we would expect to find unusual grammatical patterns among surviving languages. So if, they, if language shapes, sorry, if use shapes language, and we have a very unusual type of use, we should find a very unusual type of language. That will be the hypothesis. And there are other questions that are very relevant and very interesting from this uh, kind of uh, research program that are actually developed here. This is what I have been doing in the last months. So these are ideas that I didn't have that clear when I came. So this is good about having time to read and think and walk. But of course, some people have had the same ideas. And some people have said that actually, surviving languages are indeed special, are indeed different from other languages. And this difference points toward the idea of reduction. When you read the um, grammatical account of what I call surviving languages and what these people, my other linguists used to call obsolescent language, which are more or less uh, synonyms, synonyms for me, the idea is that these languages are reduced, simplified, poor. It's everywhere in the literature. So the first thing that we started to do some uh, time ago was to test this claim, this hypothesis, that languages in that particular situation become simpler, incomplete, lost, they lose, they lose, lose or lose, lose? They lose grammar. They, they get, they, their, their grammar get lost. And this is something that we uh, try to, to do with uh, Damian Blasi, who is a scholar at Harvard, and is a friend of, well, friend of my dog. They have a kind of love-hate relationship, <laughs> but still. And the idea was to actually test in a global scale, if it is true that langu uh, obsolescent languages, or now surviving languages, are different, simpler than vital languages or stable languages. And we, uh, and we modeled different uh, accounts of this hypothesis. The strong one would be just whatever you take, if you take one language which is surviving, or is in a survival stage, and a vital language, this one will be more complex. But then we develop also some weak models of this hypothesis. You have two languages of the same family, so they have the same ancestor, and this one is vital, and this other one is uh, surviving, and then this one should be more complex. But also, we, can, we, we also try to test this hypothesis in time. So basically, we try to see if you take two stages of the same language, in grammatical descriptions, you know, one conducted in the 30s and the other one in the, two, in the 2000s, then you would expect this, uh, the, the older um, stage to present or show a more complex um, uh, grammatical structure. And of course, there are lots of problems with this because uh, grammatical descriptions are always difficult and so on, but basically uh, for any of these uh, ideas, we found out that is not true. So that there is no, there is nothing obvious regarding the idea that, you know, indeed these languages defined by the way that they are all surviving languages are simpler than the other ones. 
And the, the, the claim or the result of this study is that we, you, we don't have evidence to say this in a global scale. Of course, there are specific cases, but for those specific cases, you have to look at other explanations, language contact with European languages, like English or Spanish, which by far ha have less morphological complexity than indigenous languages like the ones spoken in, in the Peruvian Amazon, for example. Okay, try to find another explanation. But the result of this is that this, um, the fact that you know, the surviving status of a language does not predict simplicity. And this has a, this has a lot of uh, consequences because, um, you know, for example, from a policy point of view, if somebody wants to describe or document a very, you know, a very small surviving language, you will be able to say, okay, this is a good thing to do because this language might be as complex, as rich as any other language. It might not be the case, but you can tell this by, you know, by, by default. So you have to see if this language has this particular uh, property or not. And this is basically what we got in relation to uh, method uh, theory. In relation to methodology, I have been uh, struggled with the data that I uh, collected from 2013 and 2016 doing field work uh, and documentation with this Konawa. Because linguists often assume, not explicitly maybe, but this is something that is in the air, the idea that the natural condition of language is to preserve one form for one meaning and one meaning for one form. This is like a basic theme about how we understand language. And this is from uh, Bollinger, who is also a very interesting American uh, linguist. Um, but we have a problem with this Konawa. These things there are different ways of saying, give it. Give it to me, for example, give it. So you can say inangu, inanking, just inan, with the root to give. But there is another root for, for, to, for the meaning to give. Muni, muniwu, munikin, muni. All these six forms mean give it. And go to plant, go to, you know, put some seeds and get some trees. You can say something like wishatanwu, wishatankin, wishatan, vanatanwu, vanatankin, vanatan. So there are six different forms to say the same meaning. And when it turns to subject encoding, which is a fundamental aspect of uh, grammatical description, so one of the first things that you have to do when you describe a language is understand how subjects and objects are encoded grammatically. But of course, in Iskonawa, all these sentences there mean I ate manioc. I ate manioc could be unan atzapiku, un atzapiku, ua atzapiku, or even less commonly, less frequently, uh, atzapiku. And also for, for you, eight manioc, minan atzapiku, min atzapiku, mia, mi, those forms in red here and there are the forms of the pronominal subject, like I or you, okay? But you have different forms. So what can you do with this? Well, one way to go would say, oh, okay, Let's say goodbye to the idea that there is a Iskonawa language or that the Iskonawa language has a grammar because our definition of grammar is something that is regular and tends to this idea of having one form for one meaning, one form for one meaning. This is the, the, the general idea of grammar that we have around there in the air. So I started to work in different models. And for this, I worked with another colleague also a friend of my dog, more love than hate in this case, um, called Javier Vera, who is a Chilean scholar working in my university in Peru. And the idea is that, okay, if we don't have regularity, before we say, okay, let's say goodbye to this, we don't have grammar here, we just have agrammatism, which is something that used for both aphasia and studies, a fascia studies, and for, uh, for talking about 
uh, survival languages, which is crazy. Uh, instead of doing that, let's try to make a probabilistic approach to this Konawa grammar. So we have been testing, and this is also something that I am doing right now, because the grammar that I want to write uh, about this Konawa wants to be uh, some sort of probabilistic grammar. So, and when you start to play around with different methods, with you know entropy and so on, and different kind of statistics models, and then uh, uh, random forests and so on, so you get some computer science on your data, and what you get is that beyond the you know this craziness of different forms, there are always categories that are encoded in the same way and categories that are differently encoded. So independently of the many forms that you have, it is more likely to the subject um, of, well, doesn't matter, I won't get into details. So for some subjects and some objects to be similarly marked. So doesn't matter how many different forms you have, it is more common for some categories to be similar and there is more common to other categories to be different. And this is a huge finding, I would say, because now we have some kind of regularity, but not the similar kind of regularity that we are familiar with when we do descriptive uh, work on languages. And this is something that uh, is actually something that I will probably try to uh, proceed doing on and trying to understand. And this is why I, 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 I believe that working with these Konawa people have, uh, has changed my methodologi methodologica, methodological approach to, to linguistics and to language sciences and to grammatical description. This is the last part of the talk and I have five minutes, so I'm more or less on time, amazingly. So the last part is that, of course, you have all these fascinating theoretical questions and all these interesting methodological problems that you need to solve and you will spend you know, a lot of years doing that. But this doesn't make any sense at all if you don't assume action as part of your linguistic research. If you don't put action at the core of your interaction with uh, uh, an indigenous group like the Iskonawa, then you are lost. First of all, because they won't like you. They will say, okay, well, go to your house. I, we don't care about you anymore. So, so there is a, a, a very fundamental way of collaborating and interacting and doing collaborative work, which should be focused on the idea of action, on the idea of revitalization. And this is how we started to uh, introduce, you know, I didn't know how to revitalize. I spent, I don't know how many years trying to become a linguist, 11, 12, I don't remember. I never learned how to do language revitalization. I'm very good at identifying objects and subjects, you know, very good at that, not, not that bad linguist. But, you know, language revitalization, I didn't know how to do it. And this has been a long process of learning. And the Escuelita Isconawa is the project we ended up. We don't have any money, so it's funded with, uh, you know, we don't go to restaurants, but we fund the, um, uh, this revitalization project with my wife. And this is, uh, and we have to, I need to work on other things, so it's a limit, so we meet once per, per you know, time to time, and we try to, to, to keep things in a, you know, you know, way that we can actually provide some uh, stability and support for a long time. And this is how, how it ended up being this. Two minutes, and then I am almost done. La Escuelita Iskonawa es un proyecto del propio pueblo Iskonawa, su organización política ODEPI y algunos aliados. Lo que buscamos a través de la Escuelita es preservar y transmitir la cultura y la lengua Iskonawa a las generaciones más jóvenes y a los niños, creando contextos educativos adecuados para ello. ¿Cómo se dice pluma en Iskonawa? Iskorani. Esa es la pluma del Isco. 
En la escuelita utilizamos técnicas pedagógicas muy lúdicas, basadas en el juego, en el arte, en la música e incluso en la tecnología, para que los niños y las niñas con agua puedan aprender palabras y frases en la lengua de sus abuelos y así puedan tomar conciencia de todo el valor y toda la importancia que tiene la cultura con agua en sus vidas y la puedan mantener presente en su día a día. <risa> Queremos sembrar semillas para que mañana estos niños sean jóvenes comprometidos con su cultura, con su idioma y la defensa de sus derechos del pueblo Isconaba. Yo he prestado mi casa para esta escuelita Isconaba. Me siento muy contenta porque así los niños van a aprender mucho de nuestro idioma y por qué no decir de nuestros diseños también porque soy una madre artesana. A ver, lo que más me gustó de la escuelita Isconaba fue que Roberto nos hizo aprender las nuevas palabras que no sabíamos que recién estamos aprendiendo. Yo voy a ir de nuevo en la escuelita Isconaba cuando vengan los profesores porque me encantó mucho, me gustó y, y veo que voy a aprender más cosas de ahí. Tienen que anotar todo, si no... Estoy alegre, feliz. Ya tenemos pequeña escuelita para Esconagua. Estoy alegre. Sigue más adelante. Quiero más apoyo, más. Yo quiero más apoyo. Ok, so basically, this is the same woman who was crying at the beginning of the talk because she was very sad that everything was getting lost. And she's now saying that she feels happy and joyful because now she's actually looking at their grandchildren speaking his hair, hair language. And so basically this is, this is um, all I have to, to say. Uh, so I, I believe that language revitalization should be an important part of any linguistic project in Peru, at least to some extent. You should be aware of this and, and, and linguists should be allies for indigenous uh, communities in this kind of, uh, of projects, otherwise their, their work doesn't make any sense um, to me. And the results might, you know, go beyond our expectations. We might actually get something done based on this kind of um, uh, projects. So that was all. <laughs> but if you allow me, uh, I was just wanted to show you a video of an Esconawa woman uh, personifying me which is a very fun video. Se va a burlar de Robert. That's a linguist. Toma, toma. Coffee. Strong coffee. <laughs> and now, yes, thank you. What types of programs can keep sleeping languages in use by their community? So you've shown mm -hmm. a little bit about what you're doing. So one of the, you know, in the context of these questions, so. Do the elderly there who are at the depository of the language speak with the, with the uh, children and you're trying to get the children to learn the grammar? Or how does it work? And what do you find are the programs that are most effective in revitalizing the language? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is that transmission is the most important uh, aspect of language uh, maintenance. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if you have a very small community. But if the language is transmitted, then you will probably get the language being spoken for a long time. So the question is how you activate uh, transmission. And that's a difficult uh, part, because what you do in a kind of uh, uh, you know, school environment is just to teach the language as a second language to kids who, who don't uh, speak it. So ideally, the, 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 the challenge is to uh, work so hard that at some point, these kids in the future will 
create, because the language will change a lot in the process, but they will develop some sort of neo Iskonawa and they will transmit it to the younger, to their children. Mm -hmm. and, and on the other hand, you have to be very, you know, language revitalization, it's actually a, some sort of uh, umbrella term. So you may have different uh, uh, aims, different, so in some cases it's just uh, the mother, you want people to learn some words and to use those words as a way of, you know, uh, ethnical identification. And in other cases, you might be a little bit more ambitious and say, okay, I, I want this to, to, actually, I want to have neo speakers of the language. In the case of our project, we have two neo speakers. So uh, young people who didn't know the language before we started to work, and now they can keep uh, at least uh, some interactions in the language. And this makes you feel that you can be a little bit more um, ambitious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question, uh, how did you come up with a written system? Uh, it's a, there are methodologies for, for, for that. So uh, basically the first thing is that you need to have an idea of the phonemes of the language. So you need to know which sounds are distinctive in, in the language. So for example, in Spanish, if you say pala, it means uh, something to do like this. And if you say mala, it means bat, a bat hum, uh, female. Uh, so you need to find those cases where uh, a single sound can distinguish two different words. And those ones are the ones that should be ascribed to one specific um, uh, grapheme or letter. Yeah. So for that, you need to do a little bit of uh, linguistic work and then work with the people to, to, to choose and to define um, in several uh, workshops to define how they, they want this uh, alphabet to look like. Mm -hmm. And it takes uh, like a year or so. So two questions related to that. So to which extent do you actually learn the language that you are studying? Mm -hmm. And well, let, let's go with that. So in, I have worked on various languages in Peru, but I would say that there are two on which I, you know, devoted a lot of time. So in the case of Cacataibo, I, I wanted to talk about Cacataibo, but you know, the time is short, so I wanted to focus on, on Isconawa in the end. But actually, in the case of Cacataibo, I did learn uh, the language, and I was able to, to speak, li, speak it fluently. So over the phone, you know, my, my friends will call me and complain some, about something. I will say, OK, relax, and I will be able to speak in Cacataibo. Um, but in the case of Isconawa, it's a little bit more um, difficult. Mm -hmm. Because actually, there is, as I said, there is a lot of variation. So, and I am a little bit um, reluctant to, to say, OK, this is the way in which we will go in relation to this, to this particular expression or construction. So I, I know the grammar very well, so I, well, the, the, the ways in which uh, uh, grammatical elements might, might vary, um, but, uh, and I can, you know, say words and things and uh, easily, but I wouldn't say that uh, I am a fluent speaker of Iskonawa. But this is maybe because of the particular situation. So I do, from a methodological point of view, I do think that uh, it's good for a linguist, uh, if it is yeah. possible, to, to learn the language uh, he's he or she is studying uh, or they is studying in the, in, in the base of, of, of you know, uh, if the language is a language different from he, uh, the, the language of the right. linguist. And very, very briefly, how do the children, you know, react to this project? Are, you know, they seem very interesting that they're playing, right? So it's amazing. So yeah. whenever we arrived to the to the village, they get mad, they get crazy, <laughs> they called me by so I, I got a, a Isconawa name, so they would say Tamasari, Tamasari, and they get very excited yeah. and they want to meet more. Because basically we are having trying to work on a well, right now it's in post because it's uh, actually it's the, the community now is it's raining a lot, so it's very difficult. But um, we have been trying to keep this uh, once per month. Mm -hmm. And whenever we go there, it's, or somebody from the team goes, it's, it's, a, it's very, it's, a it's like a party. Yeah, yeah. And we also try to, to get involved the, the people. So we have lunch together, dinner together, and we cook together. 
And so in the end, actually, sometimes they are like upset with each other, like, a, and then in the in the frame of the of the escuelita, they get alone well again. Yeah, yeah. Personal dynamics yes. don't escape the language revitalization projects. Oh well. Um, how is the Peruvian government uh, collaborating or promoting initiatives for indigenous language revitalization, if at all? Mm -hmm. So, something that we have to acknowledge uh, is that at least the discourse has changed. So right now we have a Ministry of Culture where we have uh, Vice Ministry, Ministry of uh, Interculturality or Inter cultural relationships, and there we have a direction for uh, indigenous languages, and, and they have done a lot of work. There is also some people doing uh, bilingual, edu uh, uh, intercultural bilingual education from the government. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that uh, there is no much money uh, available. So the discourse from the government is different right now, and this is important. But I would say that it's still very difficult to, to, to do language revitalization using money from the government. And just briefly, so the other problem is that they have this definition of, indig of um, official language based on demography. So uh, official language in Peru is a language where is, which is you know, spoken by a majority in one specific area. And languages like these will never uh, be uh, a, you know, spoken by a majority because they are small by definition. So there is like a gap there. And from the 48 languages that we have in Peru, uh, um, eight languages don't have, for example, any kind of uh, uh, education uh, support, educational support. So they're not. Taught. So they are not actually. Yeah. So you need to get money from somewhere else. To, to do that. So, um, what do you see is going to be the role of technology, of new technologies, especially like machine learning, um, in language, in, in uh, projects of language revitalization? Well, in my personal point of view, fundamental. So, okay. I, th I think that, well, there are some studies that are already showing that actually. Uh, language technologies have an, a, a positive impact in, on language revitalization. But on the other hand, in my own experience, I, I see two things. The first thing is that they really help. So they really, they are useful and relatively cheap uh, components of, of language revitalization projects. But on the other hand, there is also this uh, more um, uh, emotional thing that people, when you show uh, indigenous people, their language in a computer, or you know, a spell, a spell checker for you know an indigenous language, they really get um, happy, like they really feel proud, mm -hmm. because this changes the ideology that their languages in some way are like savage languages, um, you know, like second class languages. When you see your language used for technology, that's a good and big in impact in your in your own way on your own view, you know, or on your own ideas about your own language. Right. So uh, in my personal perspective, technology is fundamental. Perfect. Some people might think differently, but this is what I think. Um, how did you originally get in contact with the Iskonawa community? And what is the relationship between the elders, children, and the language? Uh, so um, by accident, of mm. course. Because uh, when I started to work on, on the Iskonawa language, uh, I, it was said that there were no Iskonawa speakers left. And I met, uh, I met Nelita just by chance, thinking that she was a Shipibo woman. Uh, you know, Shipibo, Konibo, it's a large uh, indigenous group in Peru. Very popular, very powerful, and they are doing wonderful things with their language. But I met Nelita thinking that she was a Shipibo woman. And then when we started to, to talk, because I think that she was ill and she needed some mm -hmm. help. So I went to help uh, a Shipibo woman. And she said, no, I'm not Shipibo, I'm Iskonawa. And then I will um, maybe get some, uh, you know, I, I can teach you some words. 
and actually so words which were different from the Shipibo words. So I realized that she was a speaker of a different language, and this is how the project started. So the next year, my colleague uh, from Tufts University, Jose Antonio Masotti, who is a Peruvian literature uh, uh, researcher, uh, he traveled around and visited various communities, and he actually found more speakers, and this is how the, the project started. So we applied a couple of times, we didn't get it, and then finally we got the support and we conducted that project. But I'm very lucky. So I would say that independently of the linguistic interest that, uh, um, that some of the questions that I have tried to put together today have, um, I would say that uh, I really love them. So I really have a, like a family relationship. They are very looking forward to meet my, my son. And they, they, you know, we are like family. Yeah. yeah. Um... Let's go back a little bit to the grammar that you mentioned a little earlier. You described variability in grammar. What about vocabulary? Do you do different speakers often use different words for the same meaning? Mm -hmm. Yes, but this is, let's say, more normal when you have uh, uh, contact situations. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the case of the, the Skonawa people, they do mix uh, Skonawa words Shipibo con words and uh, Spanish words. So sometimes the, the source of that variation can be easy to trace mm -hmm. and to s explain. So it's also the same, the same phenomena that you have in grammar, you, you have in, in, in relation to the to, to words, to the lexicon, but it's, it's perhaps easier to account for. Right. Um, the next question is Nelita mentioned needing more support. Could you name some specific examples of the type of supports that you need? So we have, um, basically each workshop has a, uh, a, a needs a budget. So, um, you know, for, for, for each, I would say that it is maybe $800 per, per, uh, per it, each um, workshop. Because of the traveling, the petrol, the materials, we get food. So this is uh, something that we are always, you know, every month we are struggled with trying to get that money to, to, to travel and to, and to do that. And so uh, on the other hand, then we need hands because, you know, uh, for example, we are um, developing computational tools and computational apps and, you know, uh, educational apps for, for the language. So if anyone knows how to program in, for uh, Android, then, and wants to do something, please send, send us a message, because this is something that we always need. And this is cheaper than publishing a book, for sure, but uh, it's still, you know, it has a price when you hire somebody. And then, and then hands, because, you know, well, the last time we went, we took uh, students from, from a university and you know they helped a lot because we were a huge group. So then we have like specific people doing this, working with this specific work uh, with the specific uh, groups of kids. Uh, so yes, any kind of support, and also the diffusion. You know, letting people know. Yes, anything. Following up on your last point, you know, uh, spreading the word about this uh, project and the Iskonawan. There is a question about cooking. Given that you enjoy cooking, are there traditional Iskonawa dishes uh, or ingredients that can be shared with the world as a way to introduce um, you know, the world to the language and the culture? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are. So they make a, some sort of a corn beer, which is very good, sometimes too strong. Uh, they eat a lot of fish, so they, know, they are very good at a, a smoking meat like fish or any meat that they get they will smoke it and smoke it and it's it's delicious and they also make uh, some sort of tamales so i don't know if you know uh, like a corn so they are so also and what else so they basically more than cooking they know a lot about uh, plants and you know things that will cure things like if you have fever then you get this and if you if your knee you know, hurts, you get something. 
so they are very knowledgeable about that. And this is something that actually, when people ask you, what do we, lo what do we lose when we lose a language, then we also lose, uh, and this is already tested in a global scale, so we know that we lose um, uh, scientific uh, systems, we know, we know knowledge, knowledge systems, and, and, uh, and they know a lot about that. So they, 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 when they say that they never, when they, before the contact, they, they never got sick, I kind of believe them. So that they maybe, yes. And, and then songs and a lot of other things that are relevant. And well, thank you. Thank you, no, Roberto, thank you, for and the amazing presentation and for answering all our questions. No, it was a pleasure. And well, thank you for having me and being so patient with me. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to our online audience for your questions. I hope you can join us for uh, future events. You can find videos of past events and in, you know, information on future events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. That's all for today. Thank you and have a great rest of the day.